Welcome to Uncopyable Women in Sales. If you're looking for actionable insights and real-world tools to turbocharge your sales starting tomorrow, well, you're in the right place. Your host, Kay Miller, earned the affectionate nickname Muffler Mama when she sold more automotive mufflers than anyone else in the world. In this podcast, Kay will talk to another superstar woman in sales as they reveal uncopyable strategies you can use to rack up more leads, snag dream clients, and take your sales numbers through the roof. Stay tuned and get ready to make more sales. And how about this? More money. Welcome to another episode of Uncopyable Women in Sales. I am super pumped to talk to Peggy Albers. Peggy is a Lake of the Ozarks realtor, entrepreneur, and true sales superstar. Her real estate journey started in 2016, and in her very first year, Peggy sold $8 million in residential and commercial real estate. She consistently closes deals worth millions of dollars. Peggy has a very inspirational story. Her determination and drive to overcome challenges has led her to extreme sales success. Peggy, welcome to the podcast. Peggy, welcome to the podcast. Yay, I guess I did that too soon. Thank you um, for having me so much. That was nice. It's totally, that's totally fine. This is very casual. And, you know, I got connected with you through Curtis O's, who is a luxury property developer there at Lake of the Ozarks. And he, when he found out that I was having this podcast, he said, you have got to interview Peggy. Now, do you go by Peggy? I saw something Peg on the screen. I um I go by whatever anybody calls me. <laughs> I'm 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 pretty easy. But You're yes, not. Curtis um Curtis is amazing and his development um definitely helps realtors be more successful. They are are done right and it's just it's just easy when you have a good development. Well, that sounds like a great uh combination there. A great partnership. So let's talk a little bit. We talked last week. Let's talk a little bit about your background, which is pretty unusual. Um, and your success is even more impressive in light of that story. So why don't you uh, take it away from there? You know, it's um, growing up in Lake of the Ozarks my whole life. It is definitely my backyard. But um, choices and decisions um, that you make sometimes come at a high price when um Everybody started using drugs. You either had to pay for them or have sex for them. And my parents really weren't wealthy. Um, so I thought at, at 13 that it would be a good idea if I would just buy my stuff so that I could sell it to all my friends and that I could have mine for free so that when I went to college for business management, um, I thought I really found my business Um, and it didn't really work out that way. I wound up getting like 25 years in prison, Um, had been in more prisons throughout the United States than any of the worst people that you would know and uh, actually missed Martha Stewart um, by a few weeks. But um, learning lessons, your actions have consequences, your actions have consequences. And I definitely had to pay for mine. Well, that really, like I said, shines a new light on your success because when, you know, Curtis told me about you, he never even mentioned that. But when I found out that background that you actually spent time in prison, it made me just in awe of your success and how so many people find excuses. And sometimes I'm included excuses to as to why things aren't working out or, you know, our sales aren't good or whatever. And you used that really as a springboard to your success. So kudos to you. Uh, You know, it's a little different when you're grateful just to have a glass of milk or a refrigerator. I do see things different. And then um, because I sat for so long, I mean, there was nothing to do but work. I mean, when I came home, I think I worked for two years straight. I mean, of just working, of being able to get up when you wanted to get up. And because you already had your mindset, you know, when you were in prison that you had to wake up and work and and of taking classes of and bettering your mind and, um, you know, changing core beliefs and changing friends. Um, I just focused everything that I had um, on trying to make a living. I mean, I was living in my parents' basement. My 
I left my son when he was two months old. That was the hardest. And I didn't get home until he was almost 16. And he was like, mom, are we going to get out of grandma and grandpa's basement? Mom, am I going to get a car? Mom, am I going to get braces? Mom. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm getting my stuff from a thrift store. And if I'm going to be a mom, you know, I had to step up. So I believe, um, you know, that part of my success was because everybody thought I was going to go back and everybody thought I was going to fail. Um, so I just decided to do the best that I could every day. And that if I didn't try to beat my sister or if I didn't try to beat my coworker or, or because I was starting at the very bottom, I mean, at the least, not at the very bottom, but I mean, of the worst of the bottom of coming out of prison, people um, I had to actually fight to get my real estate license. And um, and so I still had to work around people that didn't like me or didn't feel like I should even be licensed. And so it just made me put my nose to the ground, to be fair, honest, to give the people the knowledge that they need. And um, in the process, try to buy things where I could of owner financing and, you know, asking them to be the bank. And who ever thought that you could buy a piece of property um, and ask the people to be the bank? And so uh, people believed in me. Closed mouths don't get fed. I asked for help. I had good business plans. And I might have not got in for $50,000. And they might say, well, come back when you have 100. And, you know, would keep working until I could meet my goals. Um, but working and asking for help and listening to people smarter than you um, is what really makes me successful. The people around me, um, make me great. And I really got out of, uh, learning about you that you really do serve your customers. You really have a heart for that. And I think that shows along with your work ethic and the fact that, you know, being in prison made you more determined than ever. Like you said, some people thought you would fail and boy, have you proved them wrong. How old is your son now? He is actually 23 and uh, he's going to be 24 and he's doing really um, well. It took a while um, for us to get our bond back, um, for us to get close. It took um, him seeing my worth ethic, my success, my, oh my gosh, mom, did you sell that? You know, of kind of getting, um, you know, him on the same page. But kids do have a mind of his own. He's not taking my path. He's still trying to find his way. And I think we all are. I think that that is the hardest thing that we can do for ourselves is really forgive yourself. And when you don't, like you have a hardship or when you start caring what other people think of you, you have so many hills to climb and you have to make a living that, you know, one of the things... um in all the classes. So get this. So like you're locked up and they're like, the only way you can get out is if you're going to schooling or if you have work or, and they're like, they're having a class for dysfunctional families. I've got a dysfunctional family. Let me out. We're having a class for boundaries. Boundaries. I need boundaries. Let me out. So <laughs> here I became this little, um, you know, guru of, of, of little knowledge from here of there. And, um, you know, you realize that a lot of people don't forgive themselves. A lot of people don't let go and it, it hinders what they're truly built for. I mean, God, I feel that that's my choice that, um, has built us all for something and we have to see what he built us for. Like, what do we got? So I am on a, a 10 year quest to, to see, you know, what really God made me for. And it's the first time that, you know, I've ever done it drug free and sober. And it's kind of amazing what you can accomplish, you know, alcohol and drugs. And even though marijuana is legal here in Missouri, um, it is in Washington you know, too. Yeah. It just dampens, um, a lot of your spirit. Now, there are a lot of people that can smoke and function um it's just hard to, to find the difference it's hard to truly be the best that you can be if you're drinking or using on a daily basis right so you want a hundred percent of your capabilities of your strengths applied to what you're doing so 
And I'm just dealing with too much money of other people's money I and mean, their livelihoods. Right. Going home. Right. I mean, a $3 million or two, what do I look like freaking having a drink and smoking freaking pot going, yeah, I think you should do this. You know, it's just not cool. It's a big responsibility. And, uh, you know, you came right out on your first year, though, and sold $8 million. So how did you ramp up that quickly? You know, asking for help. I um I went around and I was very open with my story. And it seemed like the more people I told, everybody had a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle that was involved in drugs, was an alcoholic, or they themselves used to do stuff in college. They just never got caught. So I think I think my story was very real. I um I wasn't asking for anything but your listing or to let me help your friend or let me help your mother. Like, let me do it. I'm just focused. I'm not drinking. I'm not using. I'm not doing anything. That's all I'll focus on. And I think people appreciated. I made myself open 24 hours a day. And now eight years later, that has gotten um, a little tiring, you know, that people will still contact me at 1030 at night and think it's okay. And it is, but it's not you know, of of having kind of some boundaries and to find my personal space because I was so open. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of finding my more w- well-rounded. This is, this is my year, um, says to kind of step up and because it takes a lot to um, even learn your surroundings. Like I had a hard time pumping gas. I went to go get my kid at school and couldn't even open the door. So you have a lot of... Um, obstacles to overcome and then to be successful you have to um not give up you got to be strong-headed you can't doubt yourself and you just have to keep going every day if i was sick i mean like i would still show proper i would have them take the car and i can um you know just remember um you know telling the people you guys stay in the car let me go open the door you guys go in first, you know, and then I would go back to to shut off all the lights. Like even if I was sick, um, that I still helped. And so I just tried to do it different. So there was nothing and that took my goal from the inside. Well, wow. you were, I mean, you were, you have been, you still are like a bulldog. I mean, you really, your work ethic and your determination. It's just amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, it's exciting too. And I don't know, even since last week, uh, uh, I've started, you know, just another business of affordable housing. You know, it's hard. Um, the market is slowing down. And so the best agents have to make their business. So I'm going to start an affordable housing project and I'm um, starting a new office of real estate. And uh, instead of being the Peggy Albers team or somebody's team, I'm actually going to, um, it's going to be called Empowered by the Dream Team. So I would like to empower people to be themselves where we could group together and just have an elite agency, the best of the best. And and people normally don't do that. Normally it's somebody's name or somebody's group or, and and you can never find yourself. So I'm on, I'm in a process. I'm in a journey of, you know, I help my clients accumulate wealth and now I want to help other realtors by just getting a group of the elite in in different areas. So that's kind of coming soon too. So you'll be able to kind of, hopefully next year I can come back and kind of tell you um, how my year went at a glance because each one is pretty strange. Today's podcast is sponsored by the acclaimed book, Uncopyable Sales Secrets, How to Create an Unfair Advantage and Outsell Your Competition by Kay Miller. Put the secrets in this book to work, and you'll make more sales, grow your network, and become a top earner. See the show notes, or go to Amazon.com and search for Uncopyable Sales Secrets to order the book right now. Well, you you have been an entrepreneur starting the Four Seasons Property Management, right? So you and have that entrepreneurial bent. We did, but we actually, I mean, there was so much I didn't know where you wanted to start. But yeah, we started with owner financing Ozark Village, which was a unique little resort. And um, then when and got Camp Bagnall, which has got pretty great history here in Lake of the Ozarks. And I actually helped a girl um, from Florida 
who had done like almost 18 years and um, we moved her whole family down and, and now she is working there and runs the restaurant. And so that's really what I'm all about. It's helping people overcome obstacles if of businesses, if I see a need and, and I used to, um, you know, do the whole thing, buy the lawnmower and buy this until somebody like drove off with my lawnmower. And I'm like, oh my God, did he just take my stuff? Like, did, did like, I just spend 11, you know? So yeah, people take advantage um, of you. You have to try to do better, but you can't make it, let it make you sour, you right. know, of, of trying different businesses and, and getting part, everything I've done, I've done in partnerships. I know they, say that it's not a good idea but um my partners have always were all, all good kind fair people it's different um you know from being with a you know somebody who's counting pennies or or doesn't have good intentions from the beginning cuz sometimes it works out good sometimes it works out bad thank god all of mine have worked out good um but it allows you to be stronger than you are with other people's money. I really try to use other people's money as much as I can. OPM. OPM. Other people's OPM. money. OPM. Right. Right. There you go. Other people's money. Yep. And it, it's a win-win, right? It is. Especially if you, um, you know, have a good deal because the people with money are the ones to seems like that they can always make more. And so, I seem to pitch good ideas um, to people with money and they're like, yeah, it sounds good. Let's go for it. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, so when you can get a good belief system, when people see your worth ec ethic, when people just see you, you have to make people take notice. When I came home, I bought 25 billboards and uh, like Lamar had them. Um, they were, I used to work for there and a lot of these billboard places, um, like when somebody quits paying, they allow you to be on the billboard for 30 days or until the next person starts paying. And so what happens is if they don't sell it quickly, sometimes you get on this billboard for two or three or four months. So I bought 25 billboards and it only came on when they had a dead spot. So if they had a dead spot here for 30 days, they put your face up. And then if they didn't sell it for two, so it appeared that I was everywhere. And really, it's their least expensive spot. It's like $500. All you had to do is buy the laminate, you know, and spend $250. So dif different agencies have, but you have to almost um, make it, you know, make it happen. Act, act as if until it becomes, you know. So you have to create a presence of empowerment. You know, it's not easy. Um, it's not for the weak. It's not for somebody that isn't wanting to give it their all. And I mean, your friends pretty much are obsolete. You, you, I truly gave it everything that I had just because I'd lost everything. I didn't have any social security. I didn't have a home. I was living in my parents' basement. I mean, there weren't very many options for a 47 year old. Wow. With a 15 year old and a half kid that has never worked a freaking day except for trafficking at old time photos when I was a kid. Um, so I truly had to create myself. And if you don't have somebody successful in your family, go and, and, you know, I am actually with a gentleman right now that I drug with me, um, that's 94 years old. Wow. Has got great ideas, has done everything in life. And I kind of told him what I was doing and like, he's got a few ideas. So I hijacked him yesterday. We were looking over topos and I'm like, look, I have to be in this podcast in like five minutes. <laughs> and, um, and so I just drug him with me because if I can spend some time with this man and he can give me any ounce of knowledge, I've been gone. I mean, the knowledge that I need that I don't know comes from weird places, but God puts people in my path and I know when he does. And I don't need anything except a helping hand, some ideas, right? Like it just makes you powerful when you can ask for help. That's great. And, you know, you're, you know, people talk about authenticity in sales and you are definitely authentic and 
you know, tell people what you want, tell people what you want for them. And I, I think that's really powerful. Um, obviously this podcast is for women in sales. So we're getting a lot of what has made you successful, that drive and determination. And it's interesting because you said I, you came out of prison and you didn't really have a choice, but a lot of people come out of prison and they, boy, they do the opposite of what you did. So I know you have a great faith in God and just a ter- determined spirit. I mean, how, what would you recommend to other women, sales women, to, to break out and have the kind of success or, or even a fraction of the kind of success that you have had? You know, it, it takes a team. Everybody on my team has kind of made me successful. And, and so I think that you have greedy people and non greedy people, but that if you can attach yourself to have a mentor, I had a lady, um, I wasn't taking anybody on my team. I didn't want anybody. I'm not a boss. I didn't even know what I was doing. And this lady said to me, you don't have to pay me. If you just let me follow you around just for two weeks, I just, I won't say a word. And if you could, and allowed herself, she was working at a Minute Mart, a Jiffy Stop, right? And a gas station. And she just, um, you know, said, I want to do it, but I don't know if I can. But if you let me follow you around, you know, I would like to see. And so I'm like, look, I'm crazy. I mean, if you really want to follow me around. And that next morning she was sitting, um, out in her car and, um, she's like, you know, if you come in today, like I'm here and I'm like, oh my God, that lady is like in the parking lot of my office. Are you freaking serious? So like, I'm only 10 minutes away. So I kind of, um, jump up and get ready. And uh, she goes, if it's not a good time, but she followed me, um, around, listened so she could hear the things that I'm saying. So she could, a lot of times people have what it takes, but they don't know how to close the deal. The best thing that I did was work in a real estate office when I didn't have my license is so I could listen. So I think whether it's real estate, whether it's a dentist office, whether you want to be a freaking uh, a, a successful lady mechanic, that to go under somebody to work at a discounted price of knowing that I mean, not being mean, the way my street girl thinks is find the oldest people that have the good business and mentoring them and so that they might leave it to you or sell it for you or that you can come up with a plan. We have so many people um, that that are passing on of not generational wealth, but a lot of times kids don't want the family business. Right. And and kids don't want to take on that paint company or they don't want to be a welder or, you know, like my husband said, my dad had, you know, an auto body shop and I didn't want to to own one. And the sister, right, she didn't want to own an auto body shop and her husband didn't want to run an auto, you know, of. So what do you do? Do you sell it or do you allow somebody to keep your business running? I think outside of the box. I think if, you know, so to look around in your community, to look around to, not that you're going to befriend somebody to have a business, but to have somebody mentor you to maybe have the idea to have the smarts enough to maybe give a little in the end so you could get more. Who knows? Maybe you just say, you know, oh my gosh, what if, what are you doing in 10 years when you retire? Right, right. Um, you know, you... Because people don't want to broach the subject. But we have a lot of older people here that have so much knowledge, so much, and they just want to share it. You know, and so sometimes I think women um, don't think outside of the box you know, enough. Most women don't ask for help. Most women won't say, can you sell me your business for free and I can work for you? Or what do I have to have? Because most people have a little money in their homes, bridge against your home, against yourself. But 
asking for help um, and going the extra yard, but not expecting it. You know, of maybe coming out with different ideas of people that you've helped or you've cared for, or, you know, if you don't have a car, most of these people, you know, if you don't ask for help, you're not going to get fed. Now, nobody wants to be used. Nobody wants a user in your life. You're talking that somebody that gives their all selflessly because they know it's the right thing to do. But then you actually get a chance to enjoy somebody older and 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 gain knowledge. So in in any step, even if you're a dairy queen, right? Every store, you know, and I'm not just saying I'm using it as a random name that everybody needs help now. If you find a person that is going to truly step up, please know that owners take notice. And then if you say that you want to be the person that steps up because you would like to have two companies of their own, then they know that they have a full-time employee that they can put a little more into. When people know what you're worth, when people know what they're willing to give, when people know, you know, that like my assistant, she's 38 years old and, and, and she will be with me for the rest of her life. There's nobody she's got. She owns her own home. Not that she didn't own her home before but now she she has a gorgeous home makes a hundred thousand dollars and more a year you know and there's not too many assistants you know that can that that they can do that but she let it be known that she's not going anywhere and plus when i came out of prison i didn't know how to email this lady had to get her license to help protect me because i didn't know what i was doing but when you ask people for help, when you go in and tell people what your intentions are, when they meet somebody, they're like, oh, my gosh, I have the person. She's not going to be a fly by night. I think she's going to be loyal because the last thing anybody wants is to train somebody that's going to be gone in two weeks. And if women don't tell the people that they're working for what type of person they are, then they're they're just a worker. So I I have a question because, you know, you're talking about asking women, asking for what they want. And I wanted to just ask you, what is your advice? Because obviously you close a lot of deals. And I think that is something that all salespeople and and maybe more women uh, are reticent to really ask for the sale or, or recommend the sale. And I know that you're really good at getting into the buyer's head and recommending things that they that it will benefit them. So what what are your tips on really closing deals? Well, knowledge is power. And when you speak to people and they know that you know what you're talking about, like there's only 15 homes on the market and there's only five under $700,000 that if you don't want to lose this property, that we need to write a full price offer today. Now, if you're not that, and and it lets you gauge where your person's off. Then they're like, uh, 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 well, you know, we were really just looking for retiring. It allows you to file the person that you have. And if you don't ask them for the money, you can walk around it for two years showing them shit. And you didn't even know that they didn't want to buy anything until they're going to retire. And so that's what to started ask, it right? with me. Yeah. Because I showed people at first, I showed, I didn't make them sign buyer's agencies. I just worked my ass off for nothing. And we found the perfect home. And I said, oh my gosh, it's $375,000. We'll never be able to find a cheaper one. Like if we don't get this one, I'm not, you know, I'm never going to be able to help you. And the guy says, I love them all. He goes, I'm just not going to, you know, I retire out of the school district and I have two more. What? Like I've showed you 20 freaking homes. I've spent five days of my life. And you know what? That man would have probably let me keep showing him for two years until he was ready. Because of course I was good company and looking around houses were fun. You know, you have to, uh, Find who are your looky loos, who's your buyers, and you have to know when. What is their price range and when is their time frame? And do they have to sell before they're buying? Right. Because that's the hard thing too. If you have to sell before you're buying, you know, you have to be that special person that asks because I feel I'm an elderly specialist. I know 
a 75-year-old person can't sell their home if they don't know where they're going. Good point. And so that's why I get both sides of a lot of things. I find out what they need, what they want. So then when I go to a listing, I say, you guys, I have somebody, you know, just like you and I can sell their home in 35 days. They just don't want me to sell it if they don't know where they're going. And people are like, of course, you know, you give them a little, you, you, you have to help the whole thing. You have to make it happen. And so you have to be so much more than a realtor. You have to be a counselor. You have to be a friend. You have to be on top of your game. Um, so it just depends on how much you want to get into it because I create deals. I tell people, if you cut this up, because I'm still used to doing that with quarter pounds, I am like, if you cut this lot up, right, that you can sell these three lots and I can get you your house for free. And um, so you're always I'm, talking about you, that you're talking about the customer and what you can get for them, right? Yes. And so I, you, you got to make things happen. You got to ask for the money and you shouldn't ask for the money if you're not giving them the most knowledge and know what you're asking for. You know, don't put your clients in bad positions. You know, if, you know, you always have to look, you know, if something would happen, can you resell it? And if you can't get the same price out of it, you know, then you might reconsider selling it. Wow. You know what? The time has just flown by and I, I told you we're going to shoot for 30 minutes. You do your, your, it's a Kedra sent me a, an awesome bio of you and you have so much more going on in your life than real estate, making a huge impact in the community, all kinds of things. So I will include the bio with this interview so people can find out more about you. Um, yes. And, I and that's also- from John. We'll check in a few times a year so we can, um, everybody can monitor the success of Peggy Albers. That would be great. Well, I, and I know that you're just going to be a rocket ship, just like you've already been. Um, where is the best place for people to find you when they want to? I would, um, just go to PeggyAlbers.com that, um, that will take you right to my webpage. Anybody can reach me to it. 573-569-8792. But really Googling Peggy Albers and Lake of the Ozarks um, are freaking top realtor that kids have got me up on so many crazy places. And I'm with my sister and I couldn't have done anything without my sister. She is truly, you know, to have a good support system, but to really ask for help. Um, but yes, we're sisters selling the lake and, uh, she's amazing in herself. She just sold the most expensive home at $10 million, but, um, (laughs) uh, yes. So anybody can Google me. Anybody can reach out. If anybody needs, um, words of wisdom, ideas, um, I'm available pretty much 24 hours a day, preferably not after nine o'clock at night. Um, but I bring (laughs) any more. Right. I brainstorm. And, uh, but yeah, I had one of those salespeople call me and I forget what they wanted me to buy. And, uh, I said, you know, when you call somebody, you should say, do you have time to talk? Because you started right into your spiel. I'm sitting here with clients and you're not going to make any money if you do that, dude. And he goes, I love oh that. God. That is one I'm- of the things I do too. Always ask, do you have a minute? Because. Otherwise, you don't totally turn them off and, you know, you, you either get the appointment later, they might say no and you never talk to them again, but you'll make a horrible impression if you just start giving them your spiel. Right. I bought freaking $5,000 worth of Cutco knives just because the guy was kind enough to say, Peggy, I know you're busy, but do you have a second to talk and hear what I have to say? I'm like, you know what? I said, I actually don't. But if you call me back between three and four, I will. Like everybody just starts talking. So yes, if anybody needs me, if you need me, Kay, reach out. Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri is the most amazing um, place to be. The new Midwest coast will be on TV soon and everybody needs to come and check it out. Right. And, you know, right before the interview, you had, you were outside with your phone, I think, and, you know, spanning the Lake of the Ozarks. You want to show it again? It is gorgeous. I've been there actually years ago, but wow. And the development, the luxury accommodations that are being built around there, just Amazing. (laughs) Almost like you have the whole place to yourself. So yes, if anybody needs knowledge, Peggy Albers, um, 
Pet.com would definitely be the way to go. And um, I have uh, Peggy at Peggy Albert's Dream Team, too. But anybody can just Google. I think I'm I think I'm everywhere and I don't think my prison pictures show up anymore. <laughs> so um, well, I'm super excited about that. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. It's been an honor and I've already learned so much about you. And I know that our listeners will and also be encouraged and motivated. And, you know, put put your secrets to success to work. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Have a wonderful day. And I really appreciate you. Blessings. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Uncopyable Women in Sales, your source for secrets you can use to make more sales. Check the show notes for links and contact information. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please spread the word by subscribing, sharing, and leaving a five-star review. You can always learn more by going to uncopyablesales.com slash podcast. Until next time, go out and supercharge your sales like a true uncopyable rock star.